This is Lesson 2 for June 12, 2016. Unit 1, Judgment and Salvation. The topic is Maintaining Common Human Bonds. Our devotional reading today is Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 18. Background scripture is Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3. Zephaniah 3, 1 and 8. Our print passage is Zephaniah 3, 6 and 8. Our key verse is, Wait ye upon the Lord, saith the Lord, until the day that I raise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now, the NIV. Wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Our lesson aims for today is, as a result of experience in this lesson, you should be able to do three things. Number one, tell Zephaniah's prophecy that God would want to save his created people and a people's stubborn rebellion. Realize that God loves his created people and wants our obedience and will give us a second chance to save ourselves. Number three, commit to asking God to give us another opportunity for redemption and salvation. Our introduction is a story, a narrative, about Zinnia. Zinnia could not stop. She had a terrible habit. She just could not help herself. At first, she told herself that she was in control. It was no big thing. But, as time progressed, it got worse and worse. Zinnia was a gambling addict. It started innocently. After church, some of Zinnia's friends convinced her to go with them to one of the local casinos. Since she was opposed to gambling, they told her that she could enjoy the free buffet while they gambled. Zinnia believed that gambling was a sin. People who gambled could not be good stewards of the blessings that God had bestowed upon them. Well, it was Zinnia's lucky day. She received complimented chips and tokens. Why? Zinnia's friends had alerted the floor manager that it was her first time in a casino. She could try for free without using any of her own money. Wouldn't you know it, Zinnia won $500 in the slot machines. She was so excited. This was easy. They were giving money away. She decided to play some more. Her thinking was simple. If I won that easily for the first time, I'll win again. Wrong. Well, she had a string of bad luck. We all do at the slots. Her friends had to pry her away from the slot machine before she lost all that she had won. Zinnia wanted to win her winnings back, so she traveled back the next day. She not only lost her winnings back, but she she traveled the next day. But she also gambled away a good portion of her checking account. Eventually, she had emptied her checking account, savings, retirement accounts, 
Then she maxed out her credit cards and began borrowing money from friends and family. The same friends who invited her to the casino started to be begin telling her, pleading with her to get help. She would not listen. Even when she heard about a fellow employee getting arrested for embezzling company funds to feed a gambling habit, she would not stop. It seems at Zinnia would keep the consequences, would feel the consequences of her sin. What do you think happened to Zinnia? Zephaniah 3.6, King James Version. It's 6. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none pass it by. Their cities are destroyed. So there is no man that there is none inhabitant. 6. NIV For I have cut off the nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted with no one passing through. Their cities are destroyed. And no one will be left. No one at all. After prophesying against the Philistines, Zephaniah 2, 4, 7, the Ammonites and the Moabites, see Zephaniah 2, 8, and 11, the Cushites and the Assyrians. Zephaniah's words in the opening verses of chapter 3, Refocus his attention on Judah and Jerusalem. Once again, beginning in verse 6, God spoke directly to the people of Judah. God had already brought judgment against Judah's neighbors, even to these nations. Their defensive strongholds had been demolished. Their armies were no match against God's wrath. Wide areas of the surrounding nations had been so desolated that the streets were deserted. The cities had been laid waste. The residents had, taken, had been taken into captivity. God's judgment of Judah's neighbors should have been warning to the people of Judah to repent or face certain judgment. Remember Xenia's story? Her friends at first advised her that it would be fun. And then when she hit the bottom, I believe they would have deserted her. Why would they continue to sin in light of God's judgment or other nations? It was simple. They had gotten comfortable in their simple, l sinful lifestyles. The more they sinned, the harder their hearts became. They reached a point that where they were not worried about God's wrath. We have to keep in mind that the 55 year reign of King Manasseh, jo Josiah's grandfather, was marked by a peer period of relative peace. So in this warped thinking, they surmised that God must not have cared about what they did because he had not punished them for their sinful living. They did not realize that God was delaying his judgment to give them even more time to repent. What do you think? Why do some people continue to engage in self-destructive behavior, even after they have seen how such practices have damaged others. That would refer to the present hour, where people are habitually participating in drug activity. What do you think? Disbelief? Des Zephaniah 
3, 7. I said, King James Version, Zephaniah 3, 7. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thy would receive instruction, so their drilling should not be cut off. However so much, I punished them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. NIV, 7th verse. I said to the city, Surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her dwelling would not be cut off, nor all my punishments came upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all that they did. Once the habit, the addiction, take place in our hearts, doing those things are very simple. That was a time when we all were in Zinnia's shoes, and it happened to us until we came to the Lord and changed our whole uh, outlook. We established a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he promised to take away all of that evil and sinful stuff that was in our flesh and put in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of promise. Continuing through the thought of verse 6, God is recorded as thinking that the people of Judah would come to their senses. After seeing the fall of Samaria and the northern kingdom of Israel, They should have renewed reverence or fear of God. Even more, they should have gladly uh, welcomed God's correction. Verse 7. They should have recognized that unless they changed their ways, they were next. Perhaps they thought that God would give them a mild chastisement as he had done throughout their history, they would be able to fake compliance for a period, then return to their evil, adulterous ways. After all, the, ting, the, the, temple, the temple was in the southern kingdom of Judah. For the people of Judah, Jerusalem was God's holy city on earth. Because of this belief, They had a misplaced confidence in the certainty that God would never bring judgment against them. Wrong. It was so simple. All they had to do was to repent. If they did, then their homes would not be destroyed. Verse 7. Neither would God punish them. Wrong. Even after their period of extreme disobedience, especially idol worship. God was willing to forgive his chosen people. It would be an opportunity for a fresh start, yet it was all for naught. Why? They were still eager to act corruptly in all that they did. The message translation puts it this way, but it didn't faze them bright and early. She was up and at it again, doing the same old things. In other words, they love sinning too much to give it up. We remember when we were like that. We had sins that we committed that brought feelings of pleasure to our flesh. And we refuse at that time to give it up. What do you think? Why do some people go through the motion of repentance before the congregation and then return to their evil ways soon thereafter? Is that what we call playing church on Sunday? We go to church, we sing, we pray. Monday, we're right back at it. I think that sounds quite familiar with a lot of us.
until we come to believe truly that the Holy Spirit will change our heart. There must be change once we see the Holy Spirit. Come in judgment. Zephaniah 3.8 King James Therefore wait upon me, said the Lord, until the day that I raise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. To pour out upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy. Some people are believed to think this is the fire that will destroy the earth, where God destroyed the earth with water, and the next time they believe that he will destroy the earth with fire. Some people allude, allude this to a nuclear explosion. NIV, therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath upon them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Sinning too much has its consequence. As in verse 8, God made it clear that judgment was coming. Use of the word therefore signified that judgment was assured. It's going to happen. But it was not immediate. Although God delayed his judgment, most of God's chosen people still did not repent from their wicked ways as it is today. God's word verified one certainty though. He had the proof to support his coming actions. I will stand up to testify. That's verse 8. Verse eight. Judgment would come not only on Judah but also the surrounding nations. Although the people of Judah were guilty in their own right, God would also punish their evil neighbors who had perpetrated idolatry and sinful living in the region for centuries. God had given his chosen people chance after chance to repent. This is recorded as being the second chance. And with some of us, we've had third and fourth chances, yet they would not. Judah had sinned in the worst way by worshiping idol gods. God admonished them in Exodus 20 and 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That's from the NIB, NIV. As a jealous God, God would pour out his wrath on them just like a consuming fire. In actuality, the invading Babylonian army did burn all the major buildings in Jerusalem. See Second Kings 25.9 and it will explain to us how the commander burned everything in the city and they took the pots and pans and the gold from the tem temple, uh, the silver, and even some captives, the priests and their orderlies. By allowing his chosen people to go into captivity for 70 years, it provided an opportunity for the land to be purified. Some translations use the word heal from the sinful acts of the people. Some Bible scholars view verse 8 as a look toward the second coming of Christ. Near the end of the lesson, 
The question is asked, what do you think? Why do some people have to be brought to their knees before repenting, while others repent so easily? Brought to their knees, they decided to do it the hard way, that God will do nothing, and I can send all I want, and he hasn't done anything about it. But we also read that God is slow to anger, but he's going to get the job done. A closing thought. Sometimes people persist in destroying something that has been created beautiful, even when they know the grave consequences. What are some consequences of destroying a good thing? The book of Genesis tells us that God created the lights and the swarms of living creatures, and God declared creation to be good. Zephaniah recounted the way that God began to punish the people for their disobedience, hoping they would respond by correcting their behavior. Your life. The problem with sin is simple. In our human nature, enjoys the immediate result of sin. Selfish pleasure, while ignore the long-term consequences. God has not forgot. It just feels good, is some answer. Some people engage in self-destructive behavior, even after they have seen how much practices have damages others. Here we would speak in our day, as drug overdoses. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the long term does come when people will reap what they sow. Your world. We trust in God's perfect justice. We know that God and sin do not mix. So we realize that God inflicts interim times of judgment before the final judgment. That is why he is willing to forgive those who repent. Obedience is required in order to have a harmonious relationship with God. Our closing prayer for this section is, Lord God of hope, We come to you asking for forgiveness for our sins of omission and commission. For we plead the blood of Jesus to clear the slate, what he did on Calvary's hill on our behalf. We were not good enough to go to that tree, but he, O God, left his glory for a moment, came down to the earth, put on the humanity of men, Walked the earth three some years and then went to the cross on our behalf. And that brings to mind, Father, where he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he asked the God, Father God, is there any other way we can get this done? Silence. And then he said, Nevertheless, Your will be done. He bowed his head in prayer. And off he went to Calvary's Hill, place of judgment. And he was nailed to the cross. He was there for a while to the afternoon. And then Joseph of Arimathea, Asked Pilate for permission to take the body down and bury Jesus in his newly hewn tomb that he had built for himself out of the solid rock. He's in the tomb three days and three nights. Early Sunday morning he rose with all power in his hands. Power in the heavens and the earth. Power to stop the sun so that Joshua could defeat Israel's enemies. 
power to stop the clock, time. Lord God, we love you for buying us back from the slave market of sin with your death on Calvary's hill. After he rose, he spoke to Mary, Christian, and then he continued his ministry for 40 days before he ascended back to the Father. But the disciples, they were a little unhappy that he was leaving because they felt like orphans. And he told them not to worry, for I'm going away to build a mansion for you. And I'll come again. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you a comforter. And his name is the Holy Spirit. He will take care of you while I'm away for a short time. Even though that short time has been over 2,000 years. And he didn't return yet. But it's all right. We who sleep in Jesus will suddenly be awakened when he comes. And the grace shall come open. And he will speak to those. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Thessalonians. And they will rise. The spirit part of those Christians. Will unite. With the physical part. And they will be just like Jesus. For the Bible tells us. We shall see him. We are going to be like him. We shall see him as he is. And we will be in heaven with him. When all the saints meet in the air, some say have a little church before you continue on to eternity. That is our prayer for today. Thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, for putting this all together. We hope our listeners will be very attentive to all that we do here. Thank you, Father, for this message, this lesson. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.